for coming out today on this um, threatening, rainy Memorial Day weekend to honor the legacy of John Paul Hammerschmidt. May the circle be unbroken indeed. John Paul was legendary for his many achievements in his 26 years as a representative of Arkansas in the U.S. Congress. He himself, however, said that he thought his greatest achievements were what he did for veterans and the establishment of this beautiful Buffalo River as the nation's first national river. John Paul was also legendary for his ability to reach across the aisle and work with and for all the people. He co-authored the bill that was the legislation that made this a national river. He was a Republican and he co-authored it with William Fulbright and John McClellan, both Democrats. I'm sure some of you could share stories about John Paul, how he helped you personally and I hope that you will share those with the family and the, with the thank you notes that we have around. And if you don't have a personal story, if you would just please write a note on these thank you notes about your gratitude for his work for establishing this beautiful place as a national river. I think this would have been underwater, maybe, um, had it not been um, a national river. To, sell, to further celebrate his legacy, we've invited a few speakers here today. And we're also honored to have his son, John Arthur Hammerschmidt, who will um, close with some remarks. Thank you, John. <laughs> to, be to begin our brief ceremony, Mike Masterson will speak. And Mike has done a lot of things in his life. What he's best known for right now is he's a longtime editorial columnist for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and he is a staunch supporter of the Buffalo National River, nephew to John Paul. And then he'll be followed by Don Castleberry, here in the green shirt, who is retired National Park Service, also has done a lot of things in his lifetime, among them being five uh, being superintendent to five different national parks and the Midwest Regional Director of the Park System. Following him will be Dane Schumacher here on the end. She's with the Buffalo River Watershed Alliance and she will bring us up to date on current challenges facing the river. Um, and then we're going to close with a song by Mockingbird again, an original composition called Arkansas, I Hear You Calling. And it's a really wonderful, upbeat song that is very inclusive about Arkansas. And we chose that song because John Paul stood for all the people of Arkansas. It just didn't matter who, where you were from, if you were in his district, he stood for all the people of Arkansas. Afterwards, weather um, permitting, we have boats, um, and some people brought their own boats. We have decorations for them to do a tribute float. We did it yesterday. Um, it takes about 45 minutes, the entire float, um, not including your takeout. Um, it's a beautiful little float. I hope you'll, you'll join them. The point people for that float, if y'all will raise your hands as I name you, uh, Lynn Welford, who is also the mad woman behind the organizing all this. over there behind the camera, and Bob Allen and Luke Coop. Where are you? Okay. Those are the point people for the flight. And I want to thank you all again so much for being here today. And afterwards, please socialize. We have some refreshments here. Please share your stories with each other about John Paul, and please share them with, your, with the family with these notes. We'll collect them, and we'll mail them to the family. Thank you again for being here. It just warms my heart. And now, my turn. Booyah, Buffalo River. Yeah. 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 We're going to run. In this whole world, and everybody's gathered today when well, they could be doing something else, with it raining, off and on, yeah. uh, for that very reason. Lynn, thank you for contacting me, for asking me, and thanks 
to the Buffalo River Watershed Alliance and others for sponsoring this event. You know, I can tell you, I was just asked by uh, Linda uh, from the Springfield uh, TV station if John Paul would be here today. And uh, I told her well, most assuredly he'd be here with his son, my cousin, John Arthur, and uh, he'd be circulating with everybody and uh, conversing with everybody and making you laugh and making you happy to be around him because that's the, the uh, effect he had on everybody. You know, when I uh, started writing about this, it was when I read the story that I really couldn't believe I had to read it twice because I couldn't believe that the National Park Service that runs the Buffalo National River didn't know that a hog factory, I don't call it a farm, it's not a farm, it's a hog factory, let's just call it what it is, 6,500 swine, was being put in the Buffalo River National Watershed. And they didn't know, no one had told them. And my understanding was that uh, that thing, that sort of thing should have happened, uh, along with other people, like maybe the game of fish, um, even ADEQ's only, only one office that they had in Jasper to take care of this area, the people who staffed that didn't realize that this was going in. So it was obviously done what I call the good old boy system. There's no question, I've been a journalist now almost you know, 45 years all over the country, and I can recognize the good old boy system pretty well now. And so, you know, I thought, you know, this is just not right, the way it was handled. Plus, this is our Buffalo National River. And I was born in Harrison, and like John Paul, swam and played and fished and canoed in the Buffalo River all my life. And I know how precious it is, like all of you do, and so many others around this country. And so I realized that this was a cause that I needed to be up front with, involved in, as far as keeping the people apprised of what was happening. And so I began writing, and I've kept writing, and kept writing, and kept writing, and, uh, and been disappointed sometimes in my colleagues, frankly, uh, who I think they've written about it, but uh, I don't think they grasp the significance of what's going on still, how important the national story this is. It's a national story. So my only hope is that they will, you know, come to awareness at some point and realize what's going on in their own backyard. And my other hope is that Cargill Incorporated, being a comprised, I think, their board of reasonable, probably educated people, will recognize at some point, you know, this one hog factory we have in Arkansas that's probably going to, I don't think there's any question, at least among people like Dr. Brahana, that it's just a matter of time until it pollutes our first national river. Maybe they'll come to the conclusion that this probably isn't a good idea for us to, uh, to keep doing this, supplying this, place, this farm in this place. Maybe we could move this place. Maybe we could, uh, I don't know, uh, write checks and make the, uh, make the farmers whole. It's not their fault. They just want a farm. I don't blame them. But it's more than a farm. And they had experience farming, there's no question, but um, this isn't a farm. And to call it that is disingenuous. It's worse than disingenuous. I don't know, understand why the groups. Well, I think I, that's not true. I do understand. I understand why the pork producers and the Farm Bureau and all of them are pushing this and getting behind it politically. Uh, I think that my opinion is that's very much a big mistake. This is not an attack on factory farms as such. It's, it's merely a disagreement that this factory should be in this location. And. Uh, <coughs> So anyway, I, I, Uncle John will be so, I'm sure, and John Arthur will validate that as his son, uh, would be so proud to be here. He would be so happy to see this. And uh, well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And keep reading. That's all I can say. Please keep reading. If you keep reading, then I'll keep writing. Well, thanks. I really appreciated uh, getting invited out here today. I didn't know who I would see that I knew, and I looked around and... Maybe a third of the folks in here I have had some dealings with in one way or another. It's a pleasure to see you all. Pleasure to meet Mike for the first time. I've been reading all those articles. You're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't clipped them out and put them in, but uh, I certainly appreciated them. And our good friend Stan Brahana out there, we're both geologists together, and uh, I was delighted when I found out he was on the job because nobody could be better than that. 
But uh, I guess I was kind of asked, since I had a long career with the National Park Service, to uh, maybe put the Buffalo River into the context of the larger picture of, of national parks. And I'm not going to talk very long and give you a history lesson, but there's a couple of points that probably I would start with. One of them is that how many people uh, here uh, saw the Ken Burns special that, uh, about national parks? Almost everybody. And do you remember what the actual title of that program was? America's Greatest America's Best Idea. America's Best Idea. Best idea. <coughs> and that quote came from a, a great naturalist writer, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author back in the last uh, generation uh, named Wallace Stegner, and he, he called it America's best idea, the greatest contribution to world culture, and that was the establishment of Yellowstone in 1872 as the world's first national park. Uh, since uh, that time, uh, the park system has uh, enlarged slightly. And uh, today, uh, maybe Louise Miller can help me if I miss this, but I believe the current count of units in the National Park System now is uh, 407. And uh, when I was the original director for the Park Service in the Midwest, that covered uh, all the national parks in 13 states. Uh, I had that job for eight years, and we added a new national park in that region alone every year for the eight years I was there. So you can see the system uh, continues to grow. Today we have about 22,000 employees in the Park Service, um, budget of about 3.6 billion, which is not nearly enough. And um, I think about 84 million acres spread all over. About half of those acres are in Alaska. But the, uh, the the Congress, when they established Yellowstone, they were not very precise about what the objectives were. They said it was to be a public park and it was uh, to be under the Department of Interior and was to be preserved in, in perpetuity. And that was about the extent of the guidance we got from the Congress. Over the years, there's been a lot more um, legislation that's given us more guidance about that. But in, uh, in the beginning, there was no law out in that part of the world where Yellowstone is, so the United States Cavalry ran the park until we got enough parks there to need a, an agency to run it. So in 1916, the National Park Service was established, and uh, I came to work for the National Park Service in 1963, and if I count the years that I've been doing things like this uh, after I retired, uh, I will have uh, been involved in the National Park Service almost exactly half of the years that it's been in existence, which I don't know, quite sure what to make of that. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's been an honor and pleasure to work for the National Park Service. It's a good organization. Uh, when, uh, when it was established, there was more specific language and the Congress told us what we were supposed to be doing. And it said we were to conserve the scenery and the nat natural and historic uh, items and the wildlife therein and provide for the use and enjoyment in a way that preserve them for future generations. So we have this enjoyment and use, and we have preservation as a stated original goal of the National Park Service. A lot of times, uh, other agencies in the federal government that manage public land, like the Forest Service, and they're a good organization and they good work, do good work, sometimes they can't resist uh, threats to their lands uh, because they don't have that preservation as the main uh, objective in the law, uh, and I think sometimes they wish they did. Uh, so, um, so the National Park Service established in 1916, and of course everybody here probably knows that March the 1st, 1972, uh, Buffalo River, uh, National River was established. And I don't know, does everybody know that that was 
exactly the same day, a hundred years apart from the day that Yellowstone was established. March first. I'm sure uh, the congressman and, and the other co-sponsors of that bill probably knew that, and they arranged it so that that would happen. But that, I didn't know that until I did a little research before coming here today. So that's a, a kind of a nice little factoid you can put away. But um, of course, parks are protected, but it's not a perfect system, as we've learned here in the Buffalo River in recent years. And uh, it takes a lot of people to make sure that it is protected, and that's where you folks come in. And I, I, I really want to say that I appreciate everything that Mike writes and and all the work that you guys do and several of us worked on that uh, fundraiser with Dick Snyder a couple of years ago and got money for hiring the lawyers and everything. Uh, those are the kind of things the Park Service needs and it comes about because uh, people like you uh, care about uh, the values that the National Parks uh, provide and it's this individual park uh, brings to this community. Uh, parks are, uh, there's a lot of things that are similar in many of the parks that I know about. And one of them is, you think you fight the battle to get the park established and then you're home free, but you're not. What happens after that is threats arise, sometimes predictable and sometimes not. And I don't know how many of us would have thought that a hog farm on our boundary would have been something we would uh, uh, be worried about, but obviously it is. And I can tell you from my own experience, or I've had uh, park service experience in Washington and all around the country, uh, there's not a park in the system that isn't threatened in one way or another from the boundaries, from outside the boundaries. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's happening in recent years that wasn't so much true when I first started is that there are a lot more partnerships now. There are a lot more uh, examples of people like you engaging in the support of the park than we ever had back in the beginning, and that's to be uh, appreciated and, uh, and, you know, and, and highly regarded because we couldn't do it without uh, uh, the contributions that you make. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop now, and if anyone wants to talk to me later, I'll be happy to do that, but thanks again for all that you did for the National Park. It's a privilege to participate in today's gathering and pay tribute to the late Honorable John Paul Hammersmith. John Paul Hammersmith's unwavering commitment and perseverance to preserve the beauty and quality of the buff beloved buffalo serves as an example to all of us here today. And we must call upon his example to guide us in dealing with the current threat to the Buffalo National River, the ill-sighted 6,500 swine factory, which generates 3.5 million gallons of untreated raw liquid waste stored in waste ponds of questionable design and land applied to fields, many of which line Big Creek, major tributary to the Buffalo River. I'm here today at the request of the family to provide an update on progress as well as the challenges we continue to face with regard to this factory. The good news is we had a win with the federal lawsuit. The judge ruled in our favor that the process by which loan guarantees were approved for this facility was flawed and inadequate. The judge ordered a new <laughs> The judge ordered a new environmental assessment which will look at the factory and its impacts to surrounding areas. We believe there will be a public comment period and this will be our time to state our concerns and reasons why this facility is ill-sighted and does not belong in the Buffalo River watershed on Big Creek, upstream from and major tributary to the Buffalo National River and Park. The facility has asked for three modifications, two of which have been approved despite overwhelming and well-reasoned and legitimate concerns. The third latest request is for pond liners, flare, and cover. ADQ has not, excuse me, Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality has not yet approved this request. This request underscores our earliest concerns that the pond design was inadequate 
leaving open the possibility for leakage to underground circuits, which could end up in wells, springs, and in Big Creek. This is not an example of a stellar state-of-the-art facility. If approved, a 30-day comment period will be allowed. High E. coli and low dissolved oxygen readings in Big Creek are serious concerns. There may be health risks in areas open to the public. Currently, Ozark Society and Public Policy Panel are working on a third-party rulemaking. It is ongoing. We hope this will create a permanent ban for medium to large cathodes in the <coughs> Buffalo River watershed. And as I understand, Governor Hutchinson will be looking at the Big Creek Research and Extension Team data to see if the facility poses environmental and public health risks for the next several years. Legislation was recently passed which allocated $400,000 more dollars on top of $340,000 for a total of $740,000. Keep in mind, the Big Creek Research and Extension Team is funded by Arkansas taxpayers' money. We have asked Governor Hutchinson, when considering the future of this factory farm, excuse me, factory, <laughs> that he also take into consideration other studies while making any decisions. We contend that the Big Creek Research and Extension Study is not monitoring the spray fields that will receive the largest amount of swine waste. Also, the study's primary focus is gauging surface runoff rather than what is happening to untreated sewage once it seeps through the porous limestone rock and into the groundwater. Since 1985, the National Park Service has been monitoring dozens of tributaries, springs, and river sites for pollutants, including fecal bacterial. bacteria. This past year, the National Park Service saw a dramatic increase in E. coli in Big Creek immediately downstream from the CNH Hawk facility. In fact, the levels were beyond the recreational com contact limit for two months. Elevated fecal bacteria readings were also found below its confluence with the buffalo, but not above it. Besides the Park Service, nationally known hydrogeologist Dr. Van Berhana and a team were tracing for almost two years. There have been numerous letter writing campaigns initiated by very various folks, including the Buffalo River Watershed Alliance, the Ozark Society, Ozark River Stewards. Due to time constraints, I've, na I've named but a few of our challenges. To learn more, please go to the Buffalo River Watershed Alliance website or the o Ozark River Stewards website. Representatives of some of the organizations are here to answer any questions and provide more information. We also have brochures and bumper stickers. The challenges that lay before us seem daunting. What can we do to protect the Buffalo River and watershed from the current threat? I was inspired by a statement John Paul Hammerschmidt made during, 2000, during a 2009 University of Arkansas Memory Project interview for the David and Barbara Pryor Center for Arkansas Oral and Visual History. John Paul Hammersmith was asked, if you were asked for advice on someone that was going into public service and maybe run for Congress or somehow or another represent the folks in the government, what kind of advice would you give them? John Paul Hammersmith replied, bottom line advice, don't even seek public office unless you want to serve other people. If public service, if service to others isn't your main goal, forget it, because that's the bottom line of public service. I don't care whether you're appointed or elected. That's the only reason people should be in public office, is to purely serve other people. And it's easy to do. That's why we're here on earth after all, whether you're in office or out of office, whether you're a shoeshine boy, a banker, or a congressman, your goal is to serve other people. I mean, that's my philosophy about life. So what can we do? A call for preserving the beauty and quality of the beloved Buffalo River is a wonderful and powerful tribute to honor his legacy and his perseverance in protecting the Buffalo National River and Park. Call and or write letters <coughs> to our public servants, the governor, your state and national representatives and senators, Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality, Arkansas Pollution Control and Ecology Commission, Cargill. Strive to know the facts and engage in informed, well-reasoned, and meaningful dialogue. Reach across the aisle and educate whenever possible. 
Let these folks know the Buffalo River watershed should not be a testing ground for waste disposal, nor should it be a research station for industrialized agriculture. A 6,500 swine factory does not belong in the Buffalo River watershed. In John Paul Hammersmith's honor, we must be vigilant and persevere to save the buffalo again and again, whenever and wherever necessary to keep his work alive and defend his original victory. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I can assure you this is very impromptu. Uh, I had noticed from Mike's column recently that there was going to be a float on the buffalo honoring my dad. And uh, that obviously caught my attention. And so I wanted to be sure and be here to be with everyone. I already met so many uh, new folks. Enjoyed, enjoyed that immensely so far. And I just mainly wanted to say, on, on, really on behalf of my dad, we were very, very, very close, thank you for this. This is just wonderful. And I know that listening to Dane recount my dad's um, very heartfelt um, philosophy on serving others, that uh, his mother and father, had they been here, they would be busting with pride to hear you uh, recap that, as you did. Um, I might share one thing about the river. Mike alluded to it. My cousin Mike alluded to it. Briefly. But uh, well, let me back up just a second. This is honoring Dad on Memorial Day weekend. And many of you may know, he, he served in World War II. He had, I think, officially 217 combat missions in the China, Burma, India theater. So this is, uh, he would be doubly proud that this was occurring on this weekend. Um, but prior to his going overseas in the early 40s to serve his country, uh, when he was just uh, really a, a youth, uh, 12 years old, he, uh, he spent a lot of time on the buffalo um, as a 12-year-old. And he had a buddy who was uh, from Harrison as well, just north of here, who was 14 at the time, and they built a boat. My dad was 12, his buddy was 14. They uh, built it at, 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 uh, at my grandfather's lumber yard out of one by 12 sixteens that they bent for the, for the sides and uh, center match, tongue and groove uh, lumber for the floor and then they, they eventually got it watertight. <laughs> they, they brought it down to Pruitt on the back of a lumber yard truck and they more or less uh, used Pruitt, the bridge of Pruitt, as their, uh, as their base of operations. And they would uh, stay down here on the river according to my dad's stories, like a week at a time, 12-year-old and 14-year-old. And, and my dad's folks would allow that. that time. And they would uh, push that boat all the way up to about Irby, and then uh, float and fish and, and shoot snakes at night and gig frogs and do just about everything. They would sleep out underneath the, the, uh, the bridge at Pruitt, uh, depending on what kind of weather it was. They would put up a tarpaulin. And in the summertime, they would just sleep out on the sandbars on the river. So he really, really enjoyed the Buffalo River at an early age. And, and one would expect really understood what it was about. And, um, and I just wanted to share that with you because essentially this memorial float will be going in this very area where my dad um, spent so much time back about 1934. And, um, and I would just say on a personal note, it's good to get back here to Ozark Campground. I used to run, I'm a big runner, I used to run um, pretty regularly from the Pruitt uh, uh, National Park, uh, or National River Station, down that trail that comes here to Ozark Campground. I'd wow. run it a pretty good clip, catch my breath here, then I would run back. That was, uh, I'd do that about once a week. And, and uh, in our church, uh, First Presbyterian Church in Harrison, back about 1980, give or take two or three years, we held a worship service right here on a beautiful fall day, as I can recall. It was just majestic. You could see the bluffs in, in the background at that time. 
And uh, to be in, in, uh, in that type of uh, setting for worship, of course, day is Sunday, it really comes home the, the, the wonderful blessings that we have, um, that we've been given, and that we need to continue to uh, take care of as good stewards. Because um, this is, uh, as, as we all know here, this is, this is sacred ground. And I just again want to say thank you. <laughs>